John, Arctic Star Exploration is a diamond junior with a property De Beers explored decades ago. Why do you think Diagrass is an emerging diamond discovery? I added uh, Arctic Star Exploration to my bottom fish collection uh, only about a month or so ago after assessing the results that the company was achieving on the Diagrass project, which they had picked up, I think, around 2014. Now, this block is very interesting because it sits to the north of the Diavik project uh, area that Aber and Rio Tinto, well, Aber discovered with Rio Tinto, and it's northeast of the Ikadi, Ikadi Diamond, Diamond project. And the beers had been in that area in the 90s. It had done indicator mineral sampling. Uh, it somehow had managed to not find the Ikadi source of uh, all those indicator minerals. That was up to uh, Chuck Fitke and Stu Blossom with the help of BHP to accomplish. And when the uh, news started coming out about that there were diamondiferous uh, bodies that actually had macro macro grade to them, this was in November 1991, the Beers staked this chunk of land, and it proceeded to explore it quite rapidly. They ended up uh, by, uh, by 2002, they had found... Uh, several dozen kimberlite bodies. They turned out to be relatively small, half hectare to to three and a half hectare, but apparently not with the kind of uh, size distribution curves that indicate an interesting macro grade. So the beers effectively gave up, even though their indicator mineral sampling of that property area revealed trains which did not have, and it's trains that had the G10 Hartsburgated Garnet uh, indication of, uh, of diamond potential. But by 2004, they had given up on the area. Uh, they used, uh, you know, the whatever geophysics, magnetic geophysics at the time to generate these magnetic targets and, and test them all. They auctioned it to Magisker Resources, which at the time was run by Andre Odette and Jacques Latendre. It was a tough deal. It, uh, they had to spend 10 million bucks to earn 100%, but there were various stages where the beers could claw back up to 70% by simply reimbursing a couple times what they had spent. And they went and, uh, you know, finally did the caustic fusion on several pipes that the beers had not even bothered to, uh, to, to, to assess. Uh, but they didn't really find much more in the, the, the jack pine kimberlite, which by then we had the, uh, square mesh system that had been developed as a way to measure micro diamonds and which can be used to project macro grade. And that was not very promising. The jack pine appeared to be the most diamond difference, but there was another one called Finlay on which uh, De Beers uh, drilled at least seven or so holes, more than on any other, but never revealed what that was all about. And that, they let those claims lapse in around 2015, an Arctic star got in there, got helped out by Margaret Lake Diamonds, which helped put up some of the money to, to keep these uh, uh, claims in good standing. And then eventually Arctic Star started spending more money on this project. And their idea is that of a rethink of this area. Now, it's already had the first pass where the obvious geophysical targets have been drilled by the beers. And, and there's been nothing really found that that's particularly interesting. So the idea that there's going to be a very large timberlite, rich and overlooked there, that could be a standalone operation, that's very unlikely for the Diagrass project. However, both Ikadi and Diavec are depleting mines with existing infrastructure that eventually, or actually pretty fairly soon, will end up uh, representing significant reclamation liability. And then, of course, there's a Northwest Territories government desire to keep the diamond mines operating. So if somebody can find a deposit that can feed the mill for five to ten more years uh, simply by trucking it, uh, uh, that would make everybody very happy, and that would represent an exit strategy for Arctic Star, which now owns 81.5%, while the partner Margaret Diamond has 18.5%. So last year they started a drilling campaign. They found five new kimberlites. One of them, Sequoia, seems to have fairly decent uh, uh, size footprint. They haven't disclosed enough information for us to really quantify 
uh, uh, what, what its tonnage potential might be. But what was really interesting about it was that the micro diamond size distribution curve suggests a potential macro grade in the 20 to 50, 60 CPHT carats per, per 100 tons type of grade. Now, that's relatively low for, for that part of the world. However, if you can get high value diamonds, then, then, then you might be able to have a rock value that's worth open pit mining and trucking to the mill and recovering diamonds, especially if the diamonds turn out to be high value. And one of the things that's emerged in the last decade is a much deeper understanding of type 2A diamonds, which are super deep diamonds that are, that are found, uh, that form 500 to 600 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface and is formed from material that used to be ocean floor basalt that got subducted, underplating the craton, actually ending up deeper than the multi-billion year old old diamonds, the peridotitic diamonds, which tend to dominate the uh, uh, Lac de Gras, uh, Kimberlite diamonds uh, that have been mined by Diavik and Ikati. And these can be very large stones, like the ones Inkara has found at Karol, the Kulinan diamonds. And they're very unusual in that they have irregular shapes, which are not caused by resorption, and they are Flawless. They have no nitrogen, absolutely zero nitrogen, not even like uh, uh, you know close to the detection limit, uh, and 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 they typically are flawless and very valuable. And the Northwest Territory, the Slate Craton, has been somewhat disappointing in that it has not coughed up any anything that truly qualifies as a Type Two A diamond. But there's always the potential that such a subpopulation uh, somehow managed to become part of the other diamond population. And people like Chuck Dipke have been collecting uh, uh, information on chemistry, trying to figure out the magic code of what possible indicator minerals might be present in a kimberlite that suggests that there's a super deep component to this, uh, to, to the kimberlite magma that could indicate the presence of these uh, type 2A diamonds. So this year they drilled uh, six or seven more holes across this body. They are still awaiting the, the, the caustic uh, fusion results. Uh, uh, SRC has been slow getting them. They thought they would have them in, in, in mid-August. And what we want to see is we want to see confirmation that they didn't just drill into a lucky phase of this system where there might be a decent macro grade, but when you step along the strike of it, uh, uh, you get lower grade phases. And, and the DO27 was a sort of notorious for that, that there was a portion of it that was a, a later phase that was completely barren, and that ended up being bulk sampled by the underground program, which gave an unnecessarily negative portrait of what the VO27 Kimberlite, Kimberlite was all about. As, but also as part of this season, they, they drilled what may be a lobe of the Findlay pipe fin, that, that the beers had, you know, spent the most effort on, but never revealed anything. And they got some uh, good-looking uh, visual uh, uh, indicator minerals in the core, and they call this the Arbutus pipe. And this may be an indicator of what that pipe is all about. So this this is, they are seeing stuff that the beer first exploration wave, back then the beers needed to find a standalone discovery. But now we have a situation where you just need to find something that can be developed and shipped to either Ikati or Diavik. They are using uh, more sophisticated geophysical techniques. Uh, they're also using a, a different uh, sort of understanding of the geometry of these uh, kindlelights uh, before they were just believed to be these uh, uh, you know, typical carrot-shaped uh, uh, eruptions, and in, in the case of Hardy Lake, uh, the work done by Barbara Scott Smith indicated that this had actually imploded into a, uh, exploded into a, 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 a sedimentary platform based on what had fallen back into the pipes. Uh, uh, but, but now they're recognizing that some of these are weird, weird geometries, uh, perhaps similar to what we're seeing with the much older Gaucho Quay pipes. Uh, that mountain province and the beers develop, where you can have a, a sort of an elongated structure with multiple pulse nodes in it, and, and some of them might be better than others. So there's two dimensions to this uh, 
we think of the old Hardy Lake project. One is using a, a, a new geophysical techniques to tease out targets that might represent the better chemistry for which a, a source was never found by the Beers, but also to assess the potential for these large diamonds, um, maybe type 2A, but maybe simply another class of large diamonds that is present in these, and that would drag up the value, and it's not going to be a $2 billion home run like Ecaddy was for, a, for, for Diamet, but since we're starting with considerably lower valuations, getting a 5 to 10 bagger out of this type of emerging discovery, that is the reason I'm focused on that. And the whole diamond sector, it's kind of at the end of a 40-year, a 40-30 year life, life cycle. Uh, uh, there's very few juniors still active in diamonds, and uh, the natural diamond uh, supply is depleting. Uh, synthetic diamonds have emerged as a competitive threat, but uh, the, there's a significant distinction emerging between the pricing of synthetic diamonds, of which an infinite amount could, uh, you know, eventually produce, and natural diamonds, which there's going to be a finite number of these ancient diamonds that are mined from natural sources. And with technology that allows you to track where they came from, you can preserve the origin of the diamonds as, and make it truly a collectible. So Arctic Star is going to be part of this session. There's still a uh, maybe several weeks away from having the results that confirm what the Arbutus discovery is all about and, and show us uh, if Sequoia is indeed a candidate to go to bulk sampling. But it's, it's a revival of something that was tremendous uh, 30 years ago. And that also, that whole Lac de Gras diamond uh, discovery play, that also emerged in the middle of a... Uh, uh, a bear market, 1991-92 is not a particularly good time. It really took almost a year for everybody to understand the implications. You could stare at the concho, the bigger picture context, take your positions, and then in 1993, the discoveries and the validation by Diamet and BHP itself all started to come in, and then it went into truly S-curve uh, type territory. It's not the same context because the whole area has been you know, heavily explored, but we might get a mini version with regard to the Diagrass project.